Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. It's almost like we like being in church, huh? Man, it's good to be here. How many of you glad to be in church today? Okay, good. Uh, we are in the book of Mark. Is this on? Is this? Oh, okay. I, I'm excited. Oh, it's on. It's on. All right. Mark chapter number four. And we're going to jump ahead right to a verse in the middle of our passage today, even though we're studying verses 21 through 41. We're going to look at verses 33 and 34. We're going to get our context, our bearings to understand the passage that I believe God is leading us to study today. Man, it's cold outside. I'm so cold. I am not supposed to live in cold. That's why I moved to Nevada. I visited Chicago with my wife over the, over the last couple of days to teach at a couple's retreat. And it was Chicago and it was cold and it was icy and it was snowy and it was cold and it was cold. <laughs> Anybody from the Midwest? How, how, are you just thankful to God that you live here, right? And two, God bless Las Vegas. And all of our problems, you know. But at least we don't have snow. I had ice on. I had ice on my on my windshield this morning. I thought, what is? Why, why is there ice on my windshield? I don't understand. That has nothing to do with the sermon. I'm just so cold. <laughs> I can. I, I cannot wait for June to come. I liked 120. I don't mind it. I like it. All right, Mark chapter number four. The sermon series is entitled Victorious, My Kingdom Overthrown. Next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. Hey, look at me. Some of you are new believers in Jesus. You gave your life to Christ. Awesome. Congratulations. You've not been baptized. It's time to dunk you. You know what I mean? It's time for me to show you the waters of baptism. Next Sunday, you can be baptized. And if you are a new believer, you've never been baptized, sign up for baptism today by pulling out your connection card and marking baptism or by talking to the church offices. All you have to do is call or stop by the connect desk. We will sign you up or talk with one of the deacons that'll stand up here at the end of the service. Men. Thank you. Are there any men in the room? You're ready for a getaway. We have a little brocation coming up. We call it the Brocation Men's Yoked Retreat. It's just a 24-hour getaway where we're going to be spending some time searching the scriptures and having a lot of fun as well. Like we say, food, fun, fellowship, and firearms. I want to encourage you to come out to this. Sign up in the foyer on the way out or online or talk to your small group leader. They will get you to the right people. And if you need a getaway, but not so soon, you want to go as a husband or wife, consider joining Heather and I at the Israel trip coming up in November. We go every two years. Years, and maybe you'll miss the last one. You say, I'll go two years from now. No, no, you can't go two years from now. I'll go this November. You say, why this November? Jesus might come back. So you got to go. All right? But we are going to have a lot of fun at the Israel trip. And if you're interested, in, go ahead and contact the offices. We have a few spots remaining there. There is a secret that few know and even fewer speak. It's a secret to success, fulfillment, joy, love, and inner peace. This is what we spoke last week. This secret is not the cheap knockoff peddled by talk show hosts, celebrity gurus, pop psychologists. This victory cannot be replicated, duplicated, fabricated, but it can be yours. And it starts in the heart. Last week we talked about how incredibly important it is to understand that true victory begins deep down inside of the heart. And it continues when you choose your king. That's today's sermon. Choose your king. Say it with me. Choose your king. Mark chapter number four, verse 33. The king of kings, Jesus Christ, is speaking to his disciples. And he says to them in verse 33, and with many of these, uh, the, the, the narrator of the book of Mark says of Jesus, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Jesus taught in parable form. He, he gave illustrations of common life. And he used those illustrations, those visual aids, those stories, and he explained spiritual truths. 
But without a parable, he did not speak unto them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. The stories Jesus gives, he gives to the crowd and then explains the meaning of the stories to his disciples. And in this moment of Jesus' ministry, he is concerned that his disciples understand how victory is obtained. He's consumed with teaching his disciples this secret. He knew that their hearts were filled with fear and doubt. And so he told them stories to help them overcome this fear and doubt. Now, before we judge the disciples, how many of you are like me and sometimes you have more fear than you should? How many of you sometimes fear can hold you back? How many of you like that? Sure, yeah, a lot of us. How many of you are like me and sometimes you doubt what you know to be true, but sometimes it's hard for you to have the strong faith in the midst of that doubt? How many of you are like me? Well, you're like them too. That's who the disciples were. Fear and doubt. And so I say today as I open up with this proposition of the sermon, and that is this, don't be afraid. Don't doubt the process. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you in a study of your word and in understanding three stories that you told and one story that was told about you, I pray as we uncover the truths of these stories, you would help us to overcome fear and doubt to accomplish your will, to see true victory in the days and the weeks and the months to come. God, help me. Help me to express what your word says. Help me to express what you've laid upon my heart. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The sermon is very simple today. It really is. It's four stories. Three stories that Jesus told, we call them parables, and then one story at the end that was told about Jesus, demonstrating the truths of these three stories. Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 41, talk about these four stories. The first story I want you to see as relating to doubt and fear is what we're calling the lamp story. And the purpose of the lamp story, or the moral of the lamp story, is don't hide the light you've been given. Say the moral with me. Don't hide the light you've been given. Look at what Mark chapter 4, verse 21 says. It's on the screen. It says in the Bible, it says specifically, also he said unto them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not also to be set upon a lampstand? Say, what does that mean, this passage? Jesus is giving an illustration, a parable about a lamp. How many of you have ever heard? How many of you kind of grew up around Christianity. I know a lot of you didn't. How many of you grew up around Christianity or in Sunday school, you heard that song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Come on, let's sing it. This is like Sunday school. I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I was a children's pastor before I was an adult pastor. How many of you guessed that probably is true? <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We're not going to sing it. You don't know what, oh, you want, oh. Oh, come on, why not? This little light of mine. You're way off, man. Stop. He ruined it. (laughs) Do you remember this one? Do you remember this one? Hide it under a bushel. No! When I was a kid, I always loved to freak out, you know, the teacher at that point, because she would be like, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. And I used to go, hide it under a bush. And I would scream, no! (laughs) Scare my teacher. Nothing to do with the sermon. I just thought I would tell you. (laughs) This is the portion of Scripture that we get that little song. You don't light a light to hide it under a basket. You don't light a light to hide it under a bed. You light a lamp and you place it in the high spot of the room so that everyone can see the light and so that everybody can see because of the light. This would have been the lamp that the disciples would have understood uh, during this time. It would have been just a small little vessel of clay, you see, and hardened. 
You see, they would have poured oil here and then put a little wick, maybe a, a little string of sorts, a little piece of cloth. They would light that, and it would give light to the surrounding home or the surrounding room. And everybody then could see because of the light. And he says, go on in the passage, look at what the passage says on the screen. It says, what we do is we hold this and we put it on a lampstand, for there is nothing hidden which shall not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret that should not come to light. What is this parable that Jesus is telling us? What is he trying to teach us? The answer is this. Jesus is saying, the truths that I've been teaching you should not be hidden from the world. The light you have received needs to be shown to all. If you've seen the light, you should shine the light. How many of you in this room have seen the light? How many of you have understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God loves you even though we're sinners, and that he sent his son to Jesus to die upon the cross for your sins, that he was buried, that he rose from the grave, proving that he was God, and he offers salvation to anybody who receives it? That's the light of the gospel, and it should not be hid. It should be shown. But he goes on, and he says, he says, for, this, for there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed. What he's saying is, one day, the light will reveal all things. Look at me. In the day of judgment, there will be nothing hid from the judge. Nothing. Not your good works and not your bad works. Not your successes and not your sins, not yours, not mine. They will all be revealed by the light. This is what Jesus is saying. You see? The passage goes on. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Have you ever met somebody who does not have ears to hear? You say, what does that mean? You know exactly what it means. They have ears, but they are not hearing ears. And Jesus came across the same thing. A lot of people who wanted to hear Jesus, but not truly hear Jesus. And he goes on in verse 24. Then he said unto them, take heed, take heed, that is pay attention. What you hear, with the same measure you use, it shall be measured to you. And to you who hear, uh, more will be given. That is, the more light you receive, the more light you'll be given. The more you're receptive to God, the more God will give to you. Verse 25, for whoever has to him will, have, will, will be given more. But whoever does not have, even what, uh, even what he has will be taken away from him. If you reject the light God is trying to give you, he will, is, is under no obligation to send you more light. But if you receive the light God has given you, he gives even more the principle here is that you, look at me, you are responsible for the light you have been given. You are responsible to take that light and to shine that light. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are to shine, yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, I, I want to I celebrate you. Look. There are a lot of you that have been coming to this church for just a few months, and all of a sudden, as soon as you have been seeing the light of the gospel, you start bringing people to that light of the gospel. You start drawing people to the light of the gospel. And this is what Jesus is speaking of. If you've seen the light, you should receive the light. You should shine the light. Yes, we're talking about the light of the gospel, but I want to go a step further, and I want to talk about the implications of the gospel in your life. What do I mean? What I mean by that is this, is that because God has shown you the light, he did so to save your soul, but not only to save your soul, to call you on mission. If nobody has told you this since you were in kindergarten, let me be the first. You are unique. You are special. You are created by God and called by God with unique gifts and talents and special abilities that are there to advance His light. I say it this way, God has put a dream inside of you. Your dream is your calling and your calling is your ministry, so shine. 
The problem with us is often this, that we have experienced so much discouragement and so many problems that when it comes to shining the light of our dream, we get nervous. We've seen people and shared with people the dream that God has put on our hearts and we think, I don't want you to see this because of what you might think of me. You might judge me for my dream. You might think me overly ambitious. You might think me too prideful or arrogant. And so the dream that God has put on my heart, I'm going to hide under a bushel. And in doing so, we displease our master and we hold back his kingdom. Could it be the dream that God has called you to? He's called you to, but you will never see it accomplished until you tell someone about your dream. I'm saying declare it loudly. It's not always easy. It's not always the right time. If you're going to film the service, then you have to turn it down whenever you replay it. That's what... My wife and I were traveling, not just this last weekend, occasionally, because you're such a gracious church, you allow us to go to other places and teach in other churches and teach at other retreats. We were doing this a few months ago in Texas. We went down to Texas, and we stayed there a day early. The reason we got there a day early is because we like to do a little alone time before we go to minister to other people. A little Josh and Heather time. Can I get an amen? Amen. We need it. Because she needs me. I know, it's awesome. (laughs) And I need her. So a little 24 hours alone in Texas, and I said, what do you want to do? She said, I want to go to a mall. (laughs) All right, let's go. So I went to this mall, and in Texas, this is a huge mall. Like, I don't know what Texas has got to prove, you know what I mean? Like, everything's bigger in Texas. That mall was the size of Delaware. (laughs) It was huge. I'm serious. It was, we spent six hours walking around this mall. I thought, I hate it. <laughs> we had a good time, but I was tired by the end of the day, and uh, it was time to go eat. So I said, okay, let's go to dinner. And she said, where do you want to eat? I said, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's only one place I want to eat when I'm in Texas, and that's only the one place I want to eat no matter where I am, and that's Texas Roadhouse. The te- thank you. God bless you and God bless Texas Roadhouse. Um, it's a great place. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Texas Roadhouse Grill, this place. It got, it's, God created the Texas Roadhouse Grill on the eighth day. That's what happened. <laughs> the rolls are so good. The butter. They make, they make cinnamon butter. They put cinnamon in the butter. I don't think you understand what I'm saying or you would be more excited they figured out the scientists of Texas Roadhouse <laughs> have figured out how to put cinnamon in butter and then you put it on the rolls and you consume it and God is happy. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, it's very late, I'm tired and I'm exhausted. All I want to do is eat my, my $10 sirloin and uh, all the sides and I want to eat it. I want to go to my hotel room. I want to sleep. Go to bed and get up and do the, do the thing that I came to preach for. And I'm sitting there across the table and my wife says to me, she looks up and she says, after the rolls came, and I'm just exhausted. And she said, hey, Josh, she said, this would be a perfect time to talk about our hopes and our dreams and our fears. <laughs> and inside, I screamed. <laughs> no! The first statement was a statement. This is a good time. The second statement was a question. Don't you think it'd be a good time to discuss our hopes and our dreams and our fears? And again, I screamed, no. But instead, out loud, I pretended not to hear her. <laughs> huh? What? What'd you say? I, didn't, I, I can't hear you over the music and, you know. She caught on very quickly. She said, I'm going to the bathroom. And when I get back, we're going to talk about our hopes, dreams, and fears. <laughs> so she got up and left. And, and I had about three to four minutes to figure out what my hopes, goals, and dreams were. I had no... How, guys, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You're like, oh, I am not in that box right now. I am not thinking about my hopes, <laughs> goals, and dreams. I took out a napkin. I'm writing things down, you know. Men 
can be very, very apprehensive about sharing what God has been doing in their hearts. And men, it might surprise you, but women can be equally nervous about sharing the dreams God has placed in their hearts. And the reason we cover those lights under the bushel is because we know if we shared what we actually are thinking and dreaming and hoping for, if we were to do this, what will they think? Let me state boldly for the person who doubts. Let me state boldly for the person who fears. God has placed a dream deep in your heart. And you know it because it burns inside of you. It burns deep inside of you. You know that you need to write that book. You need to start that business. You need to raise that family. You need to adopt that child. You need to join that mission. You need to get healthy. You need to get rid of that weight. You need to give up that addiction. You need to run for that office. And what I'm telling you today, whatever it is, if I mentioned it or not, it's burning deep inside of you. It's a calling of God in your life. God is revealing it by the light of his word even now. He's speaking to you about it. He's confirming it in your heart. And what I'm saying is it's time to tell somebody about that dream, to declare it, to say it out loud, to make it real. You say, why? Because as you declare it, as it becomes real, you then have an opportunity to pursue it. And by God's grace, he will make it come about. And in doing so, it advances not you, it advances him and his name. Wherever his disciples succeed, his name succeeds. And so we see first and foremost as Jesus is expressing how to have victory by choosing our king. Number one, we see the lamp story. Don't hide the light you've been given. Number two, number two, second story. Number two, the farmer story. The first story is saying, you have a light, let it shine. The second story is saying, look at the farmer. Don't give up because it will happen. Are you like me? Sometimes it's easy to give up when things get difficult. The Bible says in verse 26, and Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as a man should scatter seed in the ground. Oh, it's another farmer illustration. How many of you remember the story from last week? The farmer took seed and he threw it on the ground. How many of you remember that? And the seed, I want you to answer, the seed represented what? What did it represent? The Word of God. I'm going to ask and you say the Word of God. The seed represented what? The Word of God. The Word of God. You're such a smart church. <laughs> this is good. The kingdom of God is as a man should scatter seed. Okay, he's going to scatter the seed. And that it should sleep by night and raise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. Say, what is this verse all about? Well, it's very simple. There's a farmer, and he throws seed out into the ground. And the Bible says he goes to sleep by night, and then he gets up in the day, and the seed starts to grow. And if you ask the farmer, how does that happen? He'd be like, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't. What do you mean? Well, how does, how does the, the stuff grow? He'll say, oh, it needs sunlight. No, that's not what I asked. Oh, it needs rain. That's not what I asked. Oh, you need to dig up the soil. I'm not asking how to make it grow better. I'm saying, how does a seed turn into the fruit? How? And the farmer's response will be, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It just happens. fascinating Jesus. What else will you tell us about this? The farmer doesn't know how the seed goes into a crop. It just does. Verse 28. And the earth yields crops by itself. Have you ever noticed that the earth itself just brings forth fruit, food? How many have ever had a crab apple? Amen. Don't eat it. It'll make you sick. Oh, they're... no, but they're good, right? Look, it goes on. For the earth itself can bring forth crops of itself, First the blade, and now it's going to describe. Jesus is describing the growth process. First the blade, and then the head, and then the full grain of head. The Word of God, when it's planted inside of us, it just starts to grow. Immediately. Eventually. Systematically. Strategically. We call it sanctification. 
The word of God places inside of somebody, verse 29, and that person begins to grow. And when the grain ripens, immediately he puts forth the sickle because the harvest is come. By faith, the farmer reaps a harvest, not even knowing fully how it came about. Story number two, the farmer. All you have to do is take one of these kernels, place it in the ground somewhere, and an entire stalk comes up and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more kernels come on several ears of corn. How's that happen? I don't know. It just does. Listen to me. There are too many of us asking about the dream that God has placed in our hearts. How's it going to happen? The answer is, I don't know. God will make it happen. God's the one that does it. The question is, will you give up on the process? Look at me. Some of you are new Christians, okay? Look at me. Some of you are new Christians, and you're thinking to yourself, man, pastor, I'm not becoming a great Christian yet. I mean, this is really hard. I still screw up all the time. How many of you, like, how many of you are like me, and even though you've been a Christian for a while, you still mess up occasionally? How many of you are like that? You ever get disappointed with yourself? You ever think to yourself, man, if every Christian was like me, this world would be a mess, you know? And you're like, oh, it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you ever look at yourself and say, come on, man, you've been a Christian now for a long time, and you messed up again. What's wrong with you? And you ever think to yourself, man, I don't know. I've been a Christian now for months or years, some of us decades, and you think, I just want to give up. I don't feel like I'm growing the way I need to grow. The word of God was planted in my heart and it doesn't feel like everything's happening the way it should. You ever feel like you're not growing the way you should? Honestly, Christian, how many of you are like that? Sometimes you doubt that process. Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of us do. Now look, 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 look. Though you may feel that way in the moment, ask yourself this question. Have I grown more like Jesus in the last five years. Where was I five years ago? Have I seen growth? Where was I 10 years ago? Have I seen growth? Yes, I mess up over here. But look, what God has done is he's placed the word of God in your heart and the sanctification process is not a work that you must do. It is a work that he does. You go to sleep, you wake up in the morning, you look and say, man, I'm better off than I was last year. You go to sleep, you wake up in the morning, man, Jesus is changing me. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm following after. I've not yet arrived, but look at what he's doing inside of me. And what I'm saying to you, Christian, is this. Some of you are like, man, I'm not a good Christian yet. I'm just going to give up on this thing. The answer is don't give up. It'll happen. Some of us have given up on the sanctification process and Christians will walk away from God because they, they keep seeing a little bit of problem. Some Christians, let me say this, don't give up not only on your walk, let me t give you another. Don't give up on the kingdom of God. I want to speak to some of, those, some of us who have been Christians for several decades. Now look at me. Some of us are very nervous. We get really scared. We look around the world and we say, what's happening to Christ's kingdom? What's happening to God's kingdom? What's happening to Christ's kingdom? The same thing that has always happened. I'll tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like a man who put a seed in the ground and we go to sleep and God will make it grow. Amen. The Christian church has been through far worse than it's going through right now. Don't give up, it'll happen. Let me give you something else not to give up on. Don't give up. Don't roll your eyes at this. I, I know there are a lot of cynical people. Don't give up on your dream. Your dream is the advancement of the kingdom of God in practical terms. God came to you and has planted inside of you something specific to you because only you have the ability to accomplish those things to advance the kingdom of God. Don't give up on it. Don't quit. The urge has been felt by every successful person in history. The king has felt it. Every president has felt it. Every inventor has felt it. Every soldier has felt it. Every businessman has felt it. Every hero has felt the urge to quit. Don't you quit. 
Don't give, don't give up on the calling that God has for your life. See, I can't do anything. I'm 80 years old. Moses didn't even get started till he was 80 years old. You look it up. That's a Bible fact right there. Say, man, I don't know, Pastor. I'm so young. I'm 13 years old. Some of the greatest heroes of the Bible were heroes when they were teenagers. And what I'm telling you today is, friend, you don't need to give up on the sanctification process or the kingdom of God. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up because it will happen. That's what I'm trying to say. It'll happen. Oh, there's my sermon. There it is. <laughs> I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep preaching. <laughs> Look, thank you. Look, I always wanted an apple tree, always. I wanted, I, I, I wanted an apple tree. So when we got married, I thought, I'm going to buy. I, I grew up in the desert, and I thought to myself, man, to have an apple, like, that's awesome because it's like the best scam that ever was. Yeah. You know what I mean? You buy the tree once, and it gives you apples for free every year. Some of you from the desert, you didn't know that. It's true. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, we were married, bought our first home, and I, I went uh, down to the, uh, that uh, star nursery down the road. And I got, I got an apple tree, a Granny Smith apple tree, because that's the first apple God ever created. You know, the best one. That's my favorite apple. Anybody else have a favorite apple? Anybody else have a favorite apple? Yeah, what's your favorite? Honey crisp. Honey crisp. Disgusting. Anybody? <laughs> no, I'm not trying to. It's just gross. Is somebody else? Yes? Gala apple. Terrible. The green Granny Smith apple is the apple. It's the, be- it's the only apple. The- thank you. God bless you, my friend. You're, you're, you're a deacon now. Okay, all right. So, that's how it works. <laughs> so I, we, we went down and we bought, a, we bought one, and, and I was so excited, you know, to, to plant my tree. It was like this tall, and um, we planted the tree, and I was so excited to get my free apples, and we planted it in the summer, and springtime came. It's, it's February. I'm like, pretty soon, I'm going to have apples. And March came, and the green leaves came up, and, and the flowers blossomed. I said, that's what happens, you know, the flowers, and then the apples come. And then summer came, and there were no apples. Now, you, some of you know better than I did. I don't know. And I'm like, what is going on? I was mad. Like, I genuinely, I'm not trying. I was, I was a little upset at the apple tree. I went to the Star Nursery. I complained. I'm like, you sold me a a, a lemon of an apple tree, you know, like that's not great. Like, give me a new apple tree. They said, no, 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 you're fine. It's going to be fine. I said, what are you talking about? They said, it takes three to four years before apples come on a new apple tree. I said, what? That was not in the contract. (laughs) So I went to Albertsons and bought a bunch of apples, you know. Three to four years. Man, we're impatient, aren't we? Look at me. Why would you consider quitting? It's going to happen. And it won't happen because you will it to happen. It won't be because you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and make it happen. It'll happen because God will make it happen. You'll go to sleep like the farmer. You'll wake up and you'll say, oh, and now it's time. And God will say, yeah, now it's time. Don't give up. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare quit on that dream. Number three we see today, the mustard story. Now Jesus wants to deal with the mustard story. You say, the mustard story what? Yeah, the answer to the mustard story is don't be shocked by the results. Say it with me. Don't be shocked by the results. Now when Jesus said, then Jesus said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or what shall this parable be that we shall picture it? It is like a mustard seed which is sown on the ground and is smaller than all the other seeds of the earth. But what does it say? It says, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and it shoots out large branches so the birds of the air may nest in its shade. The mustard seed. I could have showed you a mustard seed, but you would not be able to see it. And I love French's. Oh, it's backwards. Well, that would have, we'll try it again. 
No, I'm just kidding. All right. The mustard seed. No, no, no. I'm getting, I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> That'd be so messed up to be at a church that took sponsorships. <laughs> like, how weird would that be? Like, in the bulletin, it's like, Heinz ketchup, you know? <laughs> the one your pastor uses. That would be weird. I'm not saying I'm opposed to it. I'm just saying it. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, my goodness. What were we talking about? Mustard seeds. Jesus said, look, it's the smallest seed you know. Now, Jesus, I, I've heard people say, I, I've literally heard Christians say, the mustard seed is not the smallest seed in the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Didn't Jesus know that the mustard seed was not the smallest? Jesus, excuse me. <laughs> Jesus knows. He's making a point. It was the smallest seed that the people of Israel would have used for their garden. And he uses it specifically because it's such a small seed that quickly grows into a large bush. And it becomes eventually a tree if you trim it right. And it would have been the largest tree in a small garden in the Israelite garden. And Jesus is saying something very obvious and very clever and very real. And that is this. The kingdom of God is like a very small seed. It starts like a spark. And before you know it, it blossoms into a flame. The kingdom of God is like a small little seed, and before you know it, it grows into something that is beyond what anybody thought it could be. Now, that's true for the kingdom of God. I mean, can you imagine the disciples? Peter, James, John, they were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, which is basically a lake. That was their whole world. Could you imagine their imaginations or the lack of ability to understand how big the Jesus movement would become? They didn't even know about the Far East. They had never heard of the Americas. They had never even been to Europe. Are you kidding me? It, it, for them to understand what the Jesus movement, Christendom, would become is beyond their imagination. It's like a tiny little seed growing into a giant tree where birds can come and say, and they're thinking it's impossible. And Jesus is saying, what we are doing here is going to grow far beyond anything we could comprehend. Could it be that your dream, once planted, will grow beyond anything that you would have ever expected? Touching people in generations to come in ways you would have never known. Drawing people to the name of Jesus and the advancement of his kingdom above all in a way you would have never known. This is why it is such a dangerous thing to lock away your calling. You see? And so to illustrate all of these points, Jesus tells three stories. And then brilliantly, the writer of the Gospel of Mark ends the chapter by telling his own story about Jesus. And that's what leads us to the fourth story of today's sermon. Look at the fourth story of today's sermon, the King story. This part is awesome because the message and the, the, the lesson from it is this. Don't let fear control you. Some of you are ready to share your dream, but you're afraid of sharing your dream. Some of you are ready to give up because you're afraid of moving forward. And he says to us through this story, the writer of Mark, don't let fear control you if Jesus is with you. Look at what he says in verse 35. On the same day when the eventide had come, he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, let's cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took with him a long boat, along in the boat, and he was there. And the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat upon the boat, so that it was already filling. These were not big boats, you understand, because it was not a giant ocean. It was normally a lake. And sometimes the winds from the east would come in and quickly whip up the waves on the Sea of Galilee. And so they found themselves in one of these storms. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus knew the storm would come? Probably. The boat itself would have been no bigger than from this point of the stage to 
that point of the stage. And the disciples had boats because a lot of them were fishermen, and they said, okay, we're going to go to the other side, leave this crowd and go over there because there's some other people that need to hear us. By the way, what waited for them on the other side in the land of the Gadareans? Oh, my goodness. It's a crazy story I tell you next week. (laughs) There they were in the ship, and the Bible says a storm came up, and the winds were all over the place, and the waves started crashing against the ship. So much so that it started to fill the boat. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be really nervous if I'm in a boat with 11 other guys and all of a sudden the boat started to fill up with water and I'm miles away from the land and it's the middle of the night. This would make me afraid. But the Bible says something very interesting that cannot be discounted. Look at what it says. It says, and a great windstorm arose, filling the boat, verse 38, but he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. Here's the but that you need to remember. Look at me, those who are afraid. Look at me, those who doubt. Hear me. But he was in the boat. How are you going to be afraid when Jesus is in the boat? Say, oh, I don't know what's going to happen to Christianity. I don't know what happened to my home. I don't know what's happening to my business. I don't know what's happening to my dream. I can't do what you're asking me to do, Pastor. I'm afraid. How are you going to be afraid when Jesus is right there in the boat? Notice this. I love this. He's asleep. <laughs> He's like totally cool. Have you ever realized this? There was never a moment in Jesus' life from eternity past even to this moment where Jesus was like, oh, no. Never once. Jesus has always been completely and utterly in control. Even when we, his disciples, are freaking out. And the Bible says that's exactly what happens. So they, the Bible says they wake up Jesus, look at what it says, and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are about to die? Okay, there's so much in this one phrase. First, they call him teacher. I love this because instead of calling him Lord or master or son of God, they call him rabbi. To them at this moment, Jesus is a, is, isn't, is a good rabbi. He's a nice teacher. He teaches really nice things about mustard seeds and about farmers and about lamps. He's a good teacher. But in this moment, they're going to understand that he is more than a teacher. He is God himself. Teacher, don't you care that we're about to die? Now that's a great question. The one who came to die for you is not concerned that you're about to die. Look at me. Fear is irrational when you have faith in the one who is in the boat. Do you get it? So look at what Jesus does. I love this. He, he calmly rises up and he rebukes the wind and says to the sea, peace, be still. This would have been just very, very cool to see, right? Jesus wakes up, he puts his pillow down, he looks around, he's like, okay, no, it's all right. <laughs> Comes to the side of the boat, everybody's, no, I can imagine as the water tries to splash on Jesus, it just kind of, you know, goes away and he raises his arms. Stop. Isn't it great to know that at any moment Jesus can stop the storm? And we might be thinking to ourselves, then why didn't he? And the answer is because the disciples still had something to learn. Stop it. Peace, be still. (laughs) And the Bible says the winds ceased and there was a great calm that came upon them. I think there was a calm, of course, that came upon the sea and upon the wind and upon the waves, but I think the calm goes deeper into the hearts of every single one of the believers. And he says to the disciples, now these are the words that should penetrate and pierce our hearts. If you're a disciple of Jesus, he not only says it to them, I hear him saying it to us, he says to them, why are you so fearful? 
How is it that you have no faith? I was right here the whole time. And they fearfully, they, the Bible says, and they feared exceedingly and they said to one another, I love this part. The chapter ends when they say, who can this be? That even the sea obeys him. Well, the answer is he's God. He's the king. Three stories by Jesus, one story about Jesus. Don't doubt. Don't be afraid. Victory is found when your kingdom is overthrown. Victory is found when you understand Jesus is not just a nice guy who does magic tricks. Victory is found when you take it off of your head and you give the crown to him. And in this very moment, many of these disciples become true believers in Jesus. So how about you? Is it time to crown him king of your life? Is it time to repent of your sin and receive Christ? Don't wrap up. Don't leave. Listen, this is, the, this is the call. Is it time for you to acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ and give your life to him? Or are you going to hold on to it? Maybe for you, you say, I know Jesus is in the boat with me. I know he's my king and savior. And I know he's put a dream in my heart. Maybe for you it's time to declare that dream and say it out loud to some people. The first step of making it a reality. For some of you, you've been pursuing the dream that God has placed in your heart and you've been ready to quit. And I'm telling you, your decision today is to say, no, I'm not gonna quit. It will become fruitful in its time, in its season, far greater than anything I ever expected. Whatever it is that God brought you here for today, I beg you, don't leave without taking it home with you by making a decision for Jesus Christ even now. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the word of God you've given us, the great powerful truths that are found in these four stories that symbolize these truths of, of, of not being afraid and not doubting the process of what you're doing in our lives and calling us. And I pray for my friends today, every one of us, that we would, call, we would be called and we would follow. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world. 